At this time, I would like to introduce Sam Robert Carroza, the nationwide respected expert in health care, the state planning attorney. We are fortunate to have her here today. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you. And I would title this discussion, the law of your money, because when we think about finances and personal finance, my question is, what the heck does it matter how well I've saved or how brilliantly I've invested if I have a 40% chance of losing assets to a long-term illness, to capital gains taxes, to estate taxes, an expensive divorce, or my children's expensive divorce and they need money for legal fees from me, or garden variety lawsuits. Today, we need to be thinking about all of these legal protections for whatever we've happened to amass. You know, people ask, well, what level of assets do I need to have uh, to be concerned about asset protection and estate planning? And I'm not being facetious. If you have a $20,000 mobile home, uh, you need to think about protecting it because you don't want it taken in the event that we have a, a long-term illness. So we're going to talk about legal structures to protect our assets. The number one thing that we want to uh, think about preventing for our children is probate. Probate is the process by which a will is given effect. And people don't realize it. They say, I did a will. What do you mean I have to go to court? Well, the will names who is going to get my stuff. But the court in every county, in every state of the United States needs to physically inspect the will, make sure that the staples weren't taken out. They would have the ability to subpoena the witnesses to the will. In New York State, a probate of a will must be open for a minimum period of seven months. I'm doing this area of law for uh, 28 years, and I've never seen one wind up that quickly. If we're looking at a probate, uh, you better expect to be involved with it for close to a year before the beneficiaries can do anything. So what do we want to do to avoid probate? Spend all our money. <laughs> so as of the 1990s, New York State allows me to put beneficiaries on my brokerage account we could always do it on bank accounts and CDs. If I have named beneficiaries, that account will avoid probate. So I have you as the beneficiary on my account. I die, you simply have to go to the bank with a death certificate and you'll walk out of there with a check. Super easy. Um, you know, one of the main things we want to remember is to update the beneficiaries. If my husband is my primary beneficiary and I am his primary beneficiary, when would I need to update that? Not necessarily dying because I say Bill is the beneficiary, uh, but if he's not here, it goes to Mary, Susie, and Johnny. So him dying, it's not really, it sounds silly, it's not really a problem in the beneficiary context. But if he's alive and he has some problems, a cognitive impairment, um, some type of long-term illness, he had a stroke, 
Parkinson's, whatever it is, he should no longer be the primary beneficiary. So we want to, you know, this estate planning business is not one and done because you, you need to be able to react to life's curveballs in the future. So one of the main takeaways that I hope you all have is that whatever you choose to do for your family's asset protection, you want to make sure that you hold the keys to make changes in the future. Okay, any questions so far? Yes. I have some accounts, 401ks and other accounts. I don't have any children. My wife passed away. And I have beneficiaries on all my accounts. The only thing I'm concerned about is my home. Can I put a beneficiary on my home? Okay. So for the overwhelming majority of us, 80% of us 65 and over own our homes, whether that is a, a traditional house, a condo, a co-op, and for many, it's our single biggest asset. It is typically the co-op, condo, or house that pushes the family into probate. So the best way to avoid probate on real estate is what? Yeah, a trust. We want to do a trust. And people ask you know, do I need a trust? Do I not need a trust? And I think in calendar year 2024, that's not the question. The question is what type of trust do I need? You need a trust. It's as simple as that. It is primitive to hold real estate in our own names. You know, you can't turn on daytime TV without seeing, you know, trial attorneys. Did someone look at you the wrong way? You might have a lawsuit. Everyone is buggo for suing. And if real estate is in my own name and the mail carrier takes a header off my front stoop, uh, they have a beautiful lawsuit. So we want to think about a trust. The trust can be, what are the two basic types of trust? Okay, we can have a revocable trust. It's also called a living trust. This is very appealing psychologically. <laughs> I could be my own trustee. I can put the assets in. I can take the assets out at any time. And I name my three kids as the beneficiaries upon my death. Boom, it goes to them automatically, no probate. Okay, so we can avoid probate with a living revocable trust. However, in the event that I get sick and I need care beyond the measly 100 days that Medicare and the Medicare supplement give us, if I need help with care beyond that, does anyone here have long-term care insurance? No. Okay, a, a number of you too. Um, your homework assignment is to go home, look at the declarations page of your policy to see what is the daily benefit that the long-term care insurer gives you. If the benefit is $300 a day in a vacuum, that may sound like a pretty good coverage, but I, I think Osinum right now is, what is the Oh, well over $500 a day. So I have people coming to my office at Bayside to apply for Medicaid to cover the difference between what the long-term care covers and the actual private pay rate. And they're saying, you know, why the heck did I even do this and pay the premiums all of those years? So I'm not down on long-term care insurance. I think for the uh, Gen X's in the room, uh, it's going to be the only thing in town in 10 to 15 years because the state budget is uh, crippled by Medicaid costs. But for the here and now, we need to be conversant 
with how to render our assets immune from long-term care costs. And we do that not with a revocable trust. If I put my home into a revocable trust and I get sick, do you think that the home in the trust is exempt? No. I mean, it makes logical sense. If I can get my hot little hands on the asset whenever I want, because it's a revocable trust, then so can my nursing home. Um, so we need a stronger trust to protect the real estate. But the big news flash is it does not have to be a totally irrevocable trust. A totally irrevocable trust is as rotten as it sounds. I cannot change anything. I am stuck. I appointed someone else as the trustee. I named my beneficiaries. If a beneficiary died, I'm unable to change that. If I had a falling out with my trustee, I'm unable to change that. We don't have to go that far. You want to be somewhere in the middle. And for most of us, that is an asset protection trust. I sometimes call it a family trust. Uh, I sometimes call it a hybrid trust because it has elements of being revocable and there's one piece of it that is sort of irrevocable. I appoint another person to be my named trustee. I appoint John Golden to be my trustee. But if the trust is properly drafted, I'm gonna flip his wings so he can't do anything without my written permission. The only time I would need my trustee for anything is in the event that I wish to sell the property during my life. Now, can he sell it without me? No, no not if the trust is properly drafted. And I keep coming back to this mantra, if it's properly drafted, uh, because you can have a trust that's a piece of garbage. And unfortunately, I have occasion to see them in my office. Our first consultation, I ask you to bring in what you've done already. And I will say nine times out of 10, I'm not in love with the trust. You know, there are some attorneys that, and I tell the story in the book, um, this is a Bayside attorney, and that's as revealing as I'll get, um, who I'm still social friends with to this day, uh, but he asked me to look over a trust he was doing for a client, which I thought was very odd because that's not his area of practice. And I take the document home, and uh, I'm a frustrated teacher at heart, and I'm going through and I'm marking it up, and it became clear that this a piece of garbage uh, was something he found from some old or deceased attorney's files and he cut and pasted the name of his client and the document is referring to provisions of the Internal Revenue Code from you know the early 70s that have uh, long since been repealed. So now I'm in this Dear Abby quandary, like what do I do? Do I tell him it's a piece of garbage or, or what? So I called him Monday morning and I said, I, I need more information about your client to evaluate the trust. Now, should he have given me any information? No, but in my uh, facts were statements, financial statements of his client, the social security numbers, family information from his intake form. So I cobbled together a decent trust, and um, I don't know why I was still concerned about hurting his feelings, but I told him I made some changes. 
So there was not a semicolon of his that remained. <laughs> and uh, I think this was some male ego at play because he said, well, good to know I was on the right track. <laughs> but the kicker is, uh, to this day, he has a shingle out that says elder law because he has this one trust. And it, it's like a broken clock, you know, maybe it's right uh, two times a day, and it's really Russian roulette. So if you embark on this trust protection journey, you really need to be a partner in the process. You need to be able to sit down and ask. Where does it say that I can change my trustee? Where does it say that I can change my beneficiaries? This is huge. I love my kids equally, but having the ability to change who gets what allows the assets in the trust to be protected from their future liabilities. If I say in my trust that the beneficiaries are Mary, Susie, Johnny, period, and one of them is in a lawsuit, a divorce, a car accident, judgment creditors, if I did not retain the ability to change the beneficiaries as a legal matter, their future interests are what we call vested such that their creditors can put a charging lien against the property in the trust. There's never a reason not to retain the ability to make changes. Here's the language. I retain the power to reallocate the interests of the remainder beneficiaries between and amongst our husband and wife, our lineal descendants and trusts for their benefit. If one day I have the news that I have a grandchild on the spectrum and we wanna pop in, you know, a little trust to protect them. If I didn't retain the ability to go in there and change the settings, so to speak, now that uh, child's future possible inheritance would disqualify him or her from program benefits that us. Yeah. So it's the look back for Medicaid. The federal look back period is five years. So you currently have a revocable trust right now. And <clears throat> You want to change that into the irrevocable where you still retain power. And you get sick within a year or two. And does, will they still look back and you know you changed it? They went into the irrevocable. You don't change, you don't change a bad trust into a good trust. You make a new trust. Right. Yeah. And so then it's the you as trustee of the revocable trust. You're transferring it into the new trust. Right. So they will look back, even if so they will look back five years regardless. They look back five years from the day that I submit the Medicaid application. So it's very important to have a calendar and to know where the heck we are because you do get partial credit. If I put my real estate into a trust today, and I'm going along just fine for four years, and then I fall apart, and I need to be at the grand, you know, hopefully temporarily, um, I should not put in a Medicaid application if I'm still in that five years. What we should do at year four with me in a nursing facility, we should privately pay that last year, right? Think of the look back as a chasm that we want to cross. And for every month we get under our belts is one month less that we have to pay 16,000 a month. That's the way to look at it. Now, this federal, you've all heard of the look back period, right? This federal look back period will increase. 
there's no question about it that governments are running out of money to fund the Medicaid program. The look back used to be three years. In 2006, it went to five years. And there are bills in Congress right now, to one to make it seven, one to make it 10. So planning done under the current law is always grandfathered. So you would uh, kind of lock in the five-year business. Any other questions on the trust? Yeah. If you have a trust, how often mm -hmm. should you have it checked that with the law is changing? If you have a trust, how often should you have it checked? Um, I would say um, if you signed in today and you left your email, I, I'm going to let you know unless you give me a reply email that you don't want the updates, I will let you know when the law uh, changes. So what we want to keep our eye on is the look back period. Uh, you'd want to reach out and have a, a fresh set of eyes, look at all of the planning. If we have a need for care, if we need to get home care in the house, how do we protect the assets for that? Um, if we need to be in a nursing facility beyond the 100 days, how do we protect the assets for that? Um, and then if there are any big changes in the family, if a spouse has a long-term illness, I want to change my planning. He should no longer be my power of attorney, right? If he right. is bedridden. So it's important. Again, it's not one and done. We want to uh, refine this if a child has a problem. So I start out equal Mary, Susie, Johnny. Uh, Johnny is on his fourth marriage. I paid for two of the divorces and um, I, I think, you know what, Johnny's share should go to him, but let's um, customize it so it goes to him at the rate of 5% a year for 20 years. If I know in my heart that he hasn't saved sufficiently for his own retirement, provided that I retained the ability to make some changes, I can react you know, to the curveballs that we all have in our families. Yes. So if you have a child with a disability, uh, they should do a special needs trust, is that right? Otherwise the money goes to the state? Yeah, if we have a beneficiary uh, with a diagnosed special needs, um, a psychiatric issue, we're uh, bipolar, we're great you know, when they're taking their meds, not great when they're not taking their meds. The, these are all things that will cause me to want to build in further protections. So think of this as the main trust that's going to hold the real estate, my primary residence, my little vacation property in the Poconos, uh, a multifamily in Astoria. This stuff can go into the main trust and then I'm going to customize the beneficiaries. If one of my beneficiaries has special needs, then their interest in the estate is going to go to them in the form of a uh, supplemental needs trust. That's a separate trust. That a separate done. trust, but we want to connect it. So think of the estate planning like snap-on Lego pieces so that uh, you can customize it. Yeah. Uh, question, going back to your like, banks and beneficiaries, uh, are four ones and IRAs considered almost the same as a bank account? When it comes to listing a beneficiary, where or do you have to put that also in a trust or will? Okay, so let's think in terms of three categories of assets. You have the real estate, and in my humble opinion, it is bonkers to have real estate in our own names. If you want to have an LLC, an LLP, an S corporation or preferably a trust. Okay, that's the real estate. <clears throat> then you have your 401k, your 403b, your IRA, your uh, 457 deferred comp. Those accounts are invisible. So if you're taking notes, make sure you have today's date on the notes because these laws change. Eight years ago, they were able to look at the retirement accounts. 
They were able to take the retirement accounts. Now they can't. The retirement accounts are not counted when I or my spouse are applying for a Medicaid program. So I, I think your question had more to do with the beneficiaries. Uh, yes, we can have named beneficiaries on the retirement account. But if my husband had a stroke or some type of rotten problem, and I said before, he should no longer be the primary beneficiary of that retirement account or anything else. But I don't want to totally cut him out and have him, you know, rely on scraps that the kids may uh, choose to hand him if they're the primary beneficiaries. What I can do is name this trust, this Anne Margaret Carosa Asset Protection Trust, is going to be the beneficiary of my 401k. And that trust will say, if I was survived by Bill, the proceeds are held for his lifetime benefit, and the trustee has the discretion to buy him things that he may need. Um, if he's at Osinum and he wants a flat screen TV or new pajamas or whatever it is, uh, we're giving them the ability to provide him with uh, luxury and comfort without jeopardizing the assets. Yeah. If you do that and leave the sick spouse in the trust, then you will be subjected to higher taxes. It's always uh, more protected. Yeah, so your point is a sophisticated point, and it has to do with if I name my spouse as the direct beneficiary of a retirement account, um, they will end up with more money because they get a, a seamless uh, direct rollover into their own account. Uh, but if they make an election, such that uh, New York State can now go after the retirement account, I am much better off uh, instead of, we've saved taxes, but we've exposed all of the proceeds of the account to nursing home claims. I prefer the family pay a little bit in taxes and protect 80% of the value. So it-, it The nursing home would go and trust the nursing home, you would never put a retirement account in a trust. There's no reason to. I know what you're talking about, and I answered that. Um, there would be no reason to put a retirement account in the trust because A, it's already invisible for Medicaid. B, it already has beneficiaries. And C, transfer Referring it into the trust would trigger an immediate income tax consequence. So we're talking about naming the trust as the beneficiary if the spouse has a long-term illness. Okay, yes. On a 401k, um, we have no children. My husband is my primary beneficiary. If I predecease him, or he predeceases me, what do I do for a beneficiary? Well, you can have your trust as the backup beneficiary, which gives you the ability to customize the workings. I can't tell the IRA or 401k administrator that I want Mary, Susie, and Johnny to be the beneficiary, uh, but Johnny's share, I want him to get a third of it when I die. The next third, five years later, you can't customize it directly with the plan administrator. And uh, I feel like it's easier to change the trust than to go through the paperwork to change the beneficiaries in years to come. You know, I have, I think, an article in here, estate planning and the single girl, uh, because for the women in the room, we have an 80% chance of surviving our husbands. And we need to plan 
for the eventuality that we may be alone, uh, because the overwhelming majority of us will be uh, at one time. So all of this uh, topic is about what can the me of today do for the me of 15 years down the road? What can I put into place so that my uh, retirement looks the way that I want it to look? And one um, example is in my living will, and I have this form on my website, you're free to download it and make it your own. In my living will, I say, in the event that I require long-term care, I wish for the care to be provided in my home unless it's not possible, right? And unless I have some uh, really intense medical needs. So the overwhelming majority of us prefer to be at home, especially if we have a, a little cognitive issue. I think I'm going to be happier, you know, in my familiar surroundings of the past 40 years than in a nursing facility with a wacky roommate and food that I don't like. I uh, guess in the back. Thank you and say, I'm just going to go a ballpark of figures, say, $100 million or something. With all of our assets. I think you're going to have some new friends today. <laughs> <laughs> what I did with my will is gave 10% to each child and the rest to the main father, my son. And he can do whatever he needs to do with his children. Okay, so it, probably, it depends on the age of the grandchildren. I am, They're all adults. Well, what kind of adults? 20, 30? I would say all graduated college. Okay, listen, these are our personal decisions, and I'm not going to say you're right or wrong for you know, loving your grandchildren and wanting to make a direct gift to the grandchildren, but we have to be very careful here. Ever since, um, who was the actor who played Spanky on The Little Rascals? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, at, at, at one point in uh, history, he was the most famous person in the United States. And when he became of age and you know, thought he's going to come into all of the money, he learned that his parents blew through it. So ever since that time, the laws of all 50 states say that a court can oversee the monies of children. Uh, so the one definite is don't name a minor in their own name in your will, in your trust, uh, on your life insurance policy, because a court will come into play to oversee the money. And this oversight is not cheap. They appoint what's called a guardian ad litem, which is some uh, retired judge, and they love these guardian ad litem assignments because it, it's a nice little payday for them to oversee the child's money. So if you want to uh, give to a minor, put together a little trust for them. This is a revocable trust because I'm not putting anything in it now. So it can be a revocable trust. I'm the grantor, I'm the trustee. We say on schedule A, which is where you list what's in the trust, we kick it off with a ceremonial $10, but because it is created now, it's active now, it has its own tax ID number now, this little trust can be the name beneficiary on an account, on a life insurance policy. The other thing I would urge you not to do is uh, to say it goes to the grandchild directly if they're 21. Uh, 21 today is like 15, 40 years ago, okay? <laughs> and they are likely still in college, and what you give them is going to disqualify them for college-level financial aid. Mm -hmm. and furthermore, it would be subject 
to equitable distribution for a young dopey marriage that doesn't work, or uh, if he thinks he's a financial genius because he watched Shark Tank last night and he's all popped up on some investment, you know, it, it, the money is gone. They say that, uh, not down on men, but they say that male brains are not fully developed uh, until uh, the mid-20s. So I would not want to see anyone under 25 uh, get the access no matter what. And then you can customize it. You know the characters in your lives. You know their strengths. You know their weaknesses. I can customize my planning to say that the assets go to Mary, Susie, and Johnny as their separate property not to be commingled with a spouse or partner. And that's a great gift to the children because now they can show that language to their partner who says, well, why can't you invest in my you know, new um, fitness franchise or whatever it is? You're giving them the ability to say, no, you know, my mean old mother set it up this way <laughs> for the ultimate benefit of the grandkids. Yes. It's better how uh, to put your beneficiary in investment activity the trust or the uh, regulation. Okay, and that, that too is a sophisticated question. So if I have three beneficiaries, should I name them directly on the investment account or should I name my trust? And I think the answer is it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, if, if none of them require special guardrails. If I need to customize the receipt of the money for any one of them, then I should not name them directly. If they have a substance abuse issue, if they're simply a train wreck financially, uh, whatever their special situation is, if I deal with it within the trust, then <laughs> let me name that trust as the beneficiary. Yes. Yeah. You said that there were three elements to a trust: real estate, retirement accounts. What's the third one? Okay, I'm you're sorry. you're psychic. No, that was in my mind. Um, so these are not three elements of a trust. These are three categories of your assets. The real estate, which definitely think about and trust for that. Then you have number two, your retirement accounts. Those are already invisible. I hope that's good news for a lot of you. Do we have any retired teachers? Okay, so uh, your lovely TDAs are totally invisible. Then we have our third category of assets, which is the everything else. My CD, my non-retirement annuity, my non-retirement brokerage account. And for the overwhelming majority of us, we don't want to put that into the trust unless and until we have to. Because with the house in the trust, with the investment real estate in the trust, I will not feel the difference because the trust says I continue to get all of the income. My tenants don't even have to know that I had a trust. They're going to continue making the rent checks payable to me. However, if I ill-advisedly put my last $5 in this trust, I don't want to have to go to my trustee with a tin cup to go get my hair done or go out to lunch. You know, the reason why the assets in the trust are protected is because I've named a bouncer at the door, like a little buffer between me and the ultimate asset. So it's just not a fun way to live having all of my money in this trust. So the planning um, with this third category of assets for a married couple is I want you to do a very good power of attorney over each other. So if my husband has a stroke, I'm going to run up to the bank with the power of attorney. And even though we're joint on the account, without the power of attorney, they will not let me alone close a CD early. 
Okay, so get it out of your mind. You don't need a power of attorney if you're married and you're joint on the assets. You do. In order to change a joint brokerage account from husband and wife to wife, I need his power of attorney. So this is the 11th hour planning where we move the joint assets into my name. There is no five year look back between spouses. Okay, so I move everything into my name and then we would apply for Medicaid for him and I would uh, do what's called a spousal refusal. So thank you for that. Yeah. Let's say we do a hybrid trust for, for the home and two years from now we decide to sell that home. How does that affect the look back? It should not affect the look back at all. You're going to carry over that benefit to uh, your new place. So the question is, I create this trust. I put the real estate in the trust. I decide I want to sell the real estate in two years. We get my signature. We get the trustee's signature. The new people make the check payable to the trust. So if I hadn't done so already after the closing, before the celebration meal at the restaurant, I'm going to stop by a bank, open a trust account to deposit that check into it. And from that new checking account in the name of the trust, I will buy the new property, whether it's a condo or a, another piece of real estate. And if the ends of the dominoes line up, in other words, every step had the trust as uh, the main party, then I didn't uh, squander any of the time that I already had under my belt with those two years. Yeah. But if you sell and don't buy, then what happens? If you sell and don't buy, now you have a, a big brokerage account in the trust and you get the uh, interest income. You can invest it however you wish. So there's a, a great deal of flexibility. Yes. It's hard to put your spouse as the trustee. You should not put the spouse as the trustee. Put anyone else. Uh, if you don't have an A plus candidate in your life to name as the trustee, remember they have no power to do anything. They don't even have the trust document. You're going to hold the trust document. They can't get into trouble, even if they're screwball. But if you're dealing with screwballs, then maybe put two of them together as, as co-trustees. Uh, so they act as checks and balances. Yes, sir. What's the difference between executor and trustee? So we have different titles uh, for different roles. You're my agent under my health care proxy. That means you can make decisions for me in a hospital. You're my agent, or you're also called the attorney, in fact, of the power of attorney. You're the executor of the will. You're the trustee of the trust. So it, it has to do with uh, which document we're talking about. Yes. You have out of state or real estate. You saw the trust officer for that out of state? Yes, yeah, so this, this trust is a creature of the Internal Revenue Code, uh, section 671 to 677. Uh, do we have any CPAs in here? No. Uh, deals with what we call grant for trusts. So the trust is national in scope. It can hold real estate in Alaska, Hawaii, uh, all 50 states. Do you know me? out-of-state attorney to set up uh, a trust in the out-of-state uh, real estate. You do not, no. But you, you need to have a federally valid trust. Yeah, yes. And I don't see what they are saying, but we have a problem having somebody to be on the trigger before they get a trust. My children are their beneficiaries, so yeah. I'm not going to treat them as that executive. What do I do with that? Well, the question is, um, we have children as the beneficiaries. Who should we put as the executor? I, I would put the children. 
Yeah. 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 And, and you know, there's some public relations here. So if you make one primary executor on the will, you make someone else primary trustee on the trust, someone else primary on the power of attorney. Okay. Do we have any Zoom questions? Yes. Uh, if I create an asset protection trust for my house, should that trustee uh, be different than one of my beneficiaries? Uh, so I think that was a, a follow-up on this question. Should the agent, whether it's an executor or a trustee, should that be different than who the beneficiaries are? Right. And, and it does not have to be different. There was a law, and don't take a note on this, it's not the law anymore. It used to be called in the 70s, merger doctrine that I had to, and that must be in your mind, um, it used to have to be different parties as the trustee and the beneficiaries. All right, any other Zoom questions? Yes, uh, does the power of attorney on a CD help avoid probate? So power of attorney is only uh, during my life. So the power of attorney at the bank or a CD or any accounts I have at that bank or the general broad power of attorney that you do with your lawyer uh, allows the name agent to deal with the account during life if I'm unable to get to the bank. Power of attorney ends immediately upon my death and now uh, they're position of beneficiary with a death certificate allows them to take the uh, asset. Yes, in the What happens when you have uh, children who divorce their spouses and how do you protect their trust? The person that you gave the trust that the wife or husband cannot get into it on their divorce act. Okay, so how do we protect assets from um, divorces? And if you're on a game show, the answer is inherited or gifted assets are not subject to equitable distribution. That's what we call the black letter law. In real life, however, the result is a little different because the overwhelming majority of states in the US are not community property. Community property is easy to understand. Half and half, end of story. Equitable distribution means whatever the heck that judge felt like doing that morning. And you know, if my sister looks like his ex-wife and he uh, doesn't really like her that much, you know, does that come into play with the equitable distribution? So the best way to protect the assets, if we have, you know, a serial uh, marrier as a beneficiary, is to say that their one third goes to them as their separate property. And if I want to put some more teeth into it, I draft it to say they receive this on the condition that they take legal steps. This would be a prenup or a postnup that they take legal steps to keep these assets separate uh, from those that they may choose to commingle. Yes. I have a question about um, elderly parents and co-ops because a lot of seniors uh, have a co-op, you know, yeah. instead of a home. And there's, uh, I read yeah. from your book, too, layers of yeah, yeah, yeah. and taxes. My question is, like, for instance, my mom, she's widowed, right? And it's me and my sister. Instead of putting the co-op in the will, right? Because, um, you know, the co-op, you always need approval from the board, right? Yeah. And, of course, it goes for probing. The, the joint uh, tenancy with full rights of survivorship when my mom passes, and I do that now while she's alive, that way I, myself, and my sister have co-ownership. Uh, I'm going to answer I appreciate that. So, um, and avoid probing. Yes. By a show of hands, does anyone have a co-op? Okay. Uh, so, co-ops are a special animal, and uh, by way of disclaimer, I'm not giving you specific legal advice because I don't know 3,500 things about the situation. But in general, 
Um, I am not in love with the parent slapping my name on the co-op and joint tenants with rights of survivorship. That will avoid probate, but if my mother is unlucky enough to have a long-term illness between now and the time she passes away, there could be a, a nursing home claim on her half. Number one, number two, if she put my name on her half, that's the legal equivalent of making a gift to me of half. So I'm gonna have to pay capital gains later. Um, if I make a gift of appreciated property, I bought the house for 50,000 in 1978, and it's now worth 850. If I ill-advisedly gift that property to my kids, first I would lose my store property tax exemptions. Um, the asset would be subject to the child's divorces and other liabilities. But most troubling is I've given them an $800,000 capital gain. Okay, we never want to make a completed gift of an appreciated asset during life. The best way to deal with the co-op is with the Asset Protection Trust. You go to them and say, we want to transfer the stock into the trust. 50% of the co-ops allow it. 50% say no way. And there is uh, a, a very big co-op corporation in this area that uh, I'll tell you the name privately. They do not allow um, trust transfers. They used to. And you know why they stopped? Because the people in their management office wanted to pull their hair out with the shareholders coming down to them asking for legal and trust advice. So they voted, uh, the board voted to just do away with all trusts. There's one thing in New York State, though, that they can't prevent you from doing. So if your co-op says no way to trust ownership of your apartment, they cannot prevent you from doing something called an assignment of the economic interest a pertinent to the co-op. It legally is, I know. But imagine in my will, I leave the co-op to you. And they don't like you for whatever reason. They say you have too many books in the apartment or whatever the situation is. They don't have to take you as the person living in the apartment. But because I named you in the will, when you finally find someone that passes muster with the co-op, it's gonna be you that gets the money after the flip tax. They cannot dictate who gets the economic interest. They can only dictate who and how the occupancy of the apartment goes. So we do something that is legally binding on Medicaid, and that is an assignment of the economic interest of the co-op. And it's notarized, it's date stamped, and Medicaid honors this. So that's what you want to think about if you have the co-op. Yes, sir, in the yellow. Can someone put us have that Yeah. Lady Bird Deed is the equivalent of a life estate. Um, if you already have a life estate, I'm not telling you to get rid of it, but if you don't have one yet, uh, it has no benefit over the trust. It used to, before 2006, the look back on the life estate was three years, a trust was always fine. I haven't done a life estate deed since 2006, when everything across the board went to five. With a life estate deed, if we sell during my life, we're going to get whacked in the head with capital gains. If I have a child predecease me, I'm stuck uh, with their interests going through their will to my daughter-in-law. I, I, I wouldn't do a lady bird or a life estate. Yes. So, situation 
we have a mutual plan. We transfer it over to your own yellow plan. What are the UTMA accounts? What are the pros and cons of that? Yeah, don't do a UTMA account. Um, because the child gets the money at 21 and it's going to disqualify them for college financial aid. Uh, the capital gains upon uh, sale of the asset would be due. Better to do a 529 account with your financial advisor and then the money that comes out of the account is tax free. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Any final? Yes. If you are a resident, the whole property might be destroyed. If you're not Well, if you do, husband and wife need to do separate trusts. Um, and the, the flippant answer is that if you like each other, you can do one trust. <laughs> but. But we want to build in a protection because even happily married people, uh, you know that the marriage will end one day. And I, I tell the story in the book, um, I believe that if I die first, that uh, my husband would be remarried in four months. And I think that's a, a conservative guess. <laughs> and and given, given what I do for a living, I see the best in humanity and I see the worst in humanity. And I believe because he has some hair left and can drive and earn a paycheck that they're going to be flocking all over him and they're going to want their names on the deed to the house. So do you remember um, about an hour ago, I told you that we want to be able to make changes to the trust and the language I gave you is we retain the ability to reallocate the remainder interest between and amongst our lineal descendants, not some new Tony Randall baby that he has somewhere else, our <laughs> lineal descendants. So now the go-go dancer cannot be a recognized beneficiary on, on the assets. You know, we need to, I mean, it sounds silly, but we need to think about what are all of these things that can happen. Because in a blended family situation, where you have a surviving spouse with a little dementia, and she's telling him, oh, you know I'm going to take care of your kids, just, just, you know, put the house in my name, and on and on and on, and now the kids can't even enter to get their baby pictures. It, you know, it, it's a, a tragedy, sometimes a, a second marriage situation. Yeah. Do you have your house in an uh, asset protection trust all your, and all your financial accounts have beneficiary names and you have a power of attorney, would there be any reason to have a will? Oh, okay. Um, I guess superstition, right? So we should all have a nice will, but the goal is not to have to use it. After we die, little scrappy checks come in the mailbox you know, the return of an insurance premium if I didn't live uh, the quarter. And in order to negotiate that $700 check, uh, it does make it easier if they have a will. Okay, okay but um, a, a will is very basic and we want to have it in our sock drawer, but we hope we don't have to use it. Andrea? Uh, can you put a house that has reverse mortgage in a trust? And can you explain spousal refusal? Okay, so can I'm going to expand the question. Can we put real estate with a mortgage into a trust? And the answer is it depends on the trust. If the trust says that the grantor, who is also the one who took out the mortgage, if the grantor retains 100% of the use, the rights, the occupancy of the property, there is federal legislation from the late 80s 
called the Garden St. Germain Act, which says a bank cannot uh, enforce a mortgage acceleration clause if the borrower is transferring the encumbered property into a trust that they retain lifetime ownership rights. So yes, it can be done. Uh, what you don't want to do is call the bank and ask for permission, okay? Uh, because they're going to say no, but there's federal law that says um, they can't say no. So if you want to avoid the 10 month fight with them, you just do it. Uh, the mortgage runs with the real estate. So you're not trying to get out of the mortgage. You're still obligated. You signed a personal guarantee and it runs with the property. So yes, you can do it. Yeah. So in that scenario, on your death, right? There is still a mortgage remaining. Who pays the mortgage? Well, upon death with a mortgage, whether the property is in a trust or not in a trust, uh, they're going to ask the beneficiaries, are you selling it or are you going to keep it and uh, satisfy the mortgage? So they'll come up with whatever works out well for them. Yes. Is the final will oversee the trust? Or okay. Oh, that's a really good question. So what trumps? Uh, if we have the trust for the real estate and we have an old will from 1982 with different beneficiaries, the answer is the trust beneficiaries trump everything else only with respect to what is in the trust. If I have a bank account with no beneficiary, that's going to go through the will. So it pertains to different things. But you have a regular bank account and you have the beneficiary as the trust. If you, it, it depends on your bank. So uh, you should be able to have a trust as a beneficiary because it has its own tax ID number and it is a recognizable entity. Yeah. Yes. When you have a complicated trust and you go to sales, you can pay a higher rate when it's in the trust. Okay, so for income taxes during your life. The trust does not help you and it does not hurt you. It's neutral. So like I said before, if you have investment real estate in the trust, you continue to get all of the income and you're going to report it on your human being 1040 return. Because it's a grand tour trust, it is a disregarded entity for income tax purposes. So you still get your uh, 250 capital gains exclusion if you sell the property during your life. Upon death, however, when the property goes to the beneficiaries, they get all of the capital gains eliminated. So it, it's a terrific benefit. You have to sell the house within the inverted disease. Okay, so the Internal Revenue Service assumes that if you sold within the year of death, they're going to say, okay, that was the fair market value as of the date of death. If you decide you want to keep it for a couple of years, then get it appraised at the time of death so you can benchmark what that pop-up was. Yeah. Any uh, final? Yeah. Uh, FDIC changed the rule this year as far as beneficiaries and amount goes on the account. You know what that is? Yeah, um, you would take that up with your banker. Yeah. So what are we looking at as the cost of the, of the preparation <laughs> of an asset protection trust? Okay, you put John Golden on the hot seat, now I'm on the hot seat. And, and uh, I apologize in advance for giving you uh, the lawyerly answer, which is it depends on the situation, okay? Uh, but it does depend on the situation. If you want to give the office a call and have like a, a little three minute uh, powwow on the phone, I could tell you what zip code you're in. Okay. Uh, there are some of the documents you can do on your own. You can do the healthcare proxy on your own. You could do the living will on your own. You could do the form that John talked about, appointment of agent to dispose of remains. 
I just really gruesome uh, title. You can do that on your own. I have those three documents on my website and uh, you all have the website address on the card in the folders. Uh, but I think, you know, just final thoughts that I want to piggyback onto where John Golden started. And I have a section in the book talking about pre-planning. Given my peculiar profession, I spend an awful lot of time with grieving adult children. And I can tell you how comforted they are uh, to see that the parent was sensitive enough to, you know, put some of these arrangements together. You know, we've uh, all been in the situation, and I always love being in a room with John Bolton when I'm not uh, crying hysterically. You know, I, I've been in the situation making really poor decisions uh, because I was out of my mind with grief. And, and it's like, you have the most expensive this and that. And, and it was just lunacy. Um, so I, I think it's a lovely thing if we can get it together uh, to at least embark on this road, at least inform yourselves about it. Uh, his team at Gleason's, they're, you know, the finest group of people I've ever met. Every other funeral facility has sold to corporate chains. So it may have the same name on the door, but it, it's no longer a, a family-run um, group. And uh, I, I think it makes all the difference in the world. So I, I, I encourage you all to do a little something. If you go home, you download the healthcare proxy, you know, that's a, a step in the right direction. And there's a psychological phenomenon uh, called the zygarnic effect. And that is if you reduce the to-do list in your brain, you feel a little lighter, a, a little happier. So, so do I think that coming to see me and doing the trust will make you happier? I really do. Um, because it is, it's a relationship and it's not a one and done thing. If you form a relationship and then you have someone to circle back to in the future when something changes. So I uh, hope I've given you some uh, food for thought and any of you who have specific questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.